Hello everyone and welcome to the one hour knowledge management overview. This course introduces you to some key aspects of knowledge management. And we're starting with a graphic here. This graphic is right out of doctrine and it's meant to get you thinking. So what does KM do? KM is the bridge between the art and science of mission command. It's a discipline that leverages the art and science around people and technology to enable sharing of knowledge at the right place and the right time in order to enhance leader decision making and maximize organizational performance. For the Army, that's characterized as a specified task of mission command in doctrine. And during this overview, you'll hear, learn more about the value that knowledge management brings as we go along, and it'll help pull this together, and we'll revisit that as well. The Army Reserve Knowledge Management Directorate Government Leadership Team includes Colonel Kitchens, our Chief Knowledge Officer. When he's not in uniform, he's serving at the KM Proponent in his civilian capacity, writing doctrine there. Major Harris is our Acting Deputy Chief Knowledge Officer. You might know him from his role in the Continuous Process Improvement Office as Deputy Director there. And this is our contract support team. My name is Jackie McCrory. I'm on the bottom left side there. I'm one of the trainers on the team. And I'm joined here today by Joe Padone. He's our program manager. And Tiffany Adams, she's our senior trainer. And we also have, we'll, at the very end, I'll show you some training that we offer. Um, the team's always here to help. We have a ticketing system as well that's listed on the bottom here, as well as a group email box, in addition to our individual phone numbers. So the target audience for the KM overview is everyone. KM is useful to all. The objective of this overview is to provide you with a basic understanding of knowledge management so you can apply it to the problems that you're facing now and in the future. We also want to show you how the KM Directorate can help you as well. The benefits of this training could be endless. Hopefully what you learned today will inspire you to continue your education in knowledge management. For the aspiring KMRs, the knowledge management representatives out there, this overview will help prepare you for the 20-hour KMR course. And if you stay in KM, you might eventually desire to go to the three-week AKMQC course, it's the Army Knowledge Management Qualification course, where you'll pick up the One Echo uh, Skill Identifier, ASI, and become a KMO. <coughs> so our agenda today, we're going to cover these topics. I'm going to go over some KM questions, get you thinking. It is an interactive course. We are looking for your participation and your input. So those of you joining us on APAN or the conference bridge, please feel free to chime in. Any questions so far? All right, great. So how many of you have been in USARC for more than six months? Raise your hands. OK, so by now, um, hopefully you have and online, if you're on APAN, feel free to use the either the green check or the hand wave. Um, but by now, hopefully you have an appreciation of the organization. Um, I'd ask you to please take a minute to read over these 10 questions. While you read them, you know, and as you think and um, read through, um, evaluate the organization. Or if you're new to USARC and um, joining us on APAN, you can also think about past organizations that you've been a part of. And I'd just like you to think about what stands out to you. So did you ask what stands out to us? Yes. Well, it's uh, yeah. Start thinking about that. One thing I appreciate yeah. about being here at the headquarters is that there's an opportunity to do a lot of seat rights, mm -hmm. people that are replacing. Them. 
And so you're able to uh, cover down on what, they, what they've done and, and where they've stored the information that they've been working on and shared the right. Uh, but uh, as far as uh, managers of, uh, of SharePoint, I was just talking through this with a new guy that was coming in uh, for force management. Uh, there were several pages on force management. Uh, mm -hmm. Some are updated on a regular basis and some are not. Most are not and haven't been in about three or four years. And that was three rotations ago mm -hmm. when that person left. And, and it's one thing that one person leaves, but like I said, it's been about three three rotations now. Yeah. And nobody's bothered to go in and clean it up or update. Mm -hmm. so. so maybe question eight resonates with you then about the heart of that is getting to um, content management and continuity. Right. A bit of version control as well. Organizational turbulence. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's, it's, yes. yeah, it's always a big a big one. Um, that's the one that comes to mind to me is every time at least I can't remember a time going into an organization where there was that clean handoff. There was always a three to six month period where you're still going through discovery learning because there really wasn't a lot of prep work put into that transition and that's where we I don't think we spend a lot of time thinking through that as individuals um, and keep jobs and making sure that we've got that as good a transition set as we possibly can have and I think that's one of the things that gets commanders too because if you multiply that over the over the span of a, over, the, over an organization you can see how commanders can get easily um, significantly challenge, especially not only existing ones, but think about changing command at the same time as well, how organizations struggle. So that's one of the things that we, we need to continuously focus on is how to deal with personal turbulence, organizational turbulence, and making sure that organizations are continuing to flow. That's the one that resonates with me after all my years of service. And on APN, uh, <coughs> we're being asked if we can identify ourselves when we start talking in the room, just because oh. they don't know who's in the room. Uh, and we also have uh, reflect on a single topic, never. Everything is always about turning off the immediate fire, and once you've accomplished that, another fire pops off. Never a dull moment. And so that's, that's the only number nine. Maybe. Okay. So the objective of the questions here is to force you to start thinking about your organization with a KM critical eye um, and how these questions apply to your organization. Each of the questions relates to a different area in knowledge management. Uh, they're the types of things that we work with. For example, the question that's asking about meetings that relates in KM to meeting management, meeting analysis, and battle rhythm development. So a lot of us were fans of questions number one and two because they really get to the heart of, you know, if you have a learning organization, and you're willing to learn new things, that kind of set, sets the stage. If you're not willing to learn, how can you get any better? You know, how can the organization improve? So a uh, thing to note there is learning organizations generally have leadership um, that has a, you know, a climate. They set the climate, embrace things that allow learning as well. I know Tiffany, um, one of her favorite questions here is number two. Um, if an organization is closed and it's not open to new ideas, how are we ever going to get better doing what we do? And the concept of open and close applies to more than just learning itself. Um, that's where we also refer to the topic of culture. Open means we're not fearful of making mistakes as well. And then innovation, you know, desiring uh, to achieve excellence. Ultimately, KM boils down to innovation and learning but you can't have either without culture. So at the end of the day, what we're looking for is the right people, the right culture, and willingness to change. And we've got another APM. Uh, so our first class, Bob, said question three. It's not about how, uh, it's not so much about how many we have, but the right audience is present. I find it's actually less productive to have too many people as opposed to not enough for the meetings. So for question number three, how many meetings do you have? Great yeah, that's, that's a great point. And it's not in our deck here, but there have been a lot of studies um, done about the optimal meeting size and generally, you know, how many you want to have if it's something where a decision has to be reached. I think it's about five to eight people normally. Um, I think in my agile classes, they've talked about it, you know, what can 
you know, five to eight people, that would that would be uh, where you would achieve consensus. Okay, does anything else stand out to anyone before we move on? Anybody else on APAN, a question, one of the questions that stick out to you and your organization? We will talk more about meetings and achieving efficiencies with that as well. Okay. So what is knowledge management? And as we just saw in the 10 questions, how hard is it to share knowledge? Knowledge management is a dynamic discipline. It's superficially represented by this graphic. It requires people to understand that each of the three pillars that you see, um, this is also called the KM Parthenon, so you can think of the pillars as columns as well. So each of those must be understood to help an organization improve. And if you think back to that larger graphic on the first slide, we're continuously evaluating and understanding the complexity of KM. And as we do that, we achieve higher levels of success. So what you don't see by the, on this slide are the dynamics going into the three pillars that help reinforce what, that we're maximizing organizational performance. So again, this is the Army graphic for KM. And the purpose overall is to create shared understanding through the alignment of people, processes, and tools in that order within an organizational structure or culture in order to increase collaboration and interactions between leaders, people of influence, and subordinates. So these, again, are within that organizational culture. That's why it's stretched across the top there. And notice that people is the first pillar, using processes, which comes second, and tools are last. None of this matters without the right people and the right organizational culture. So that's why that's up top. It all has to be synchronized. So people are the most important. Relationships are built on trust. If there's not trust, then you don't have those relationships there. If there are no relationships, then there's no culture. When we refer to processes here, we're talking about how we do what we do, how things are done in the organization. And tools refer to anything that's used in order to conduct those processes. For example, SharePoint, um, APAN is a tool that we're using today. Mill Suite we also use, and that's how we collaborate and get information out there and disseminate it. Is there anything, does anything stand out about this as, you, as we go through this? Is there anything that you guys want that stands out from some of this information on CAN or the definition? Do you, do you see the complexity or how complex it can be? Yes, sir. Major Finn here from Force Management. It, yeah, it makes sense. In the order, you, you pointed out the order, it's people, processes, and tools. Um, it has to begin with people. And, uh, and having a common knowledge of, of a process. Um, it's kind of a little frustration with me, with my career in the <coughs> Army Reserve, is that, uh, especially in logistics, um, you know, we had a system of record, and then we then several organizations within the Army Reserve creates other processes that's already managed by, mm -hmm. like, the logistics information warehouse, you know. It's like, why are we duplicating efforts? And uh, so understanding the processes and understanding that they're available can make a difference. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. So then across the top organization, um, everything is working together, and that, that helps the organization work more efficiently, and it builds the overall organizational culture, which is the commonly held you know, shared beliefs, values, norms, and practices for everyone working here in the Army Reserve at this command. So what does this Parthenon mean? We have the bullets underneath there. Technically, uh, we can make that four if we have the, the bluff at the bottom there uh, included in that. So we're talking about knowledge sharing. That's the ability to share knowledge and information throughout our organization. Knowledge sharing efficiency. That's how simple or how difficult it is to find and share information. How easy it is to disseminate knowledge as well. And then continuity. We, we spoke about that with the turbulence in an organization. And it also refers back to number eight that we talked about in the 10 questions. That's when we're doing that left seat, right seat ride, or continuity book. We want to also make sure we're not spending a lot of time and money recreating products that already exist. 
or either that used to exist and you can't access it anymore. And then our unspoken fourth bullet. Um, that's the so what down at the bottom. The why of this slide is really um, that it's, everything is coming together to help leaders make better informed decisions in a timely manner. And then we're preventing rework. So we want to prevent knowledge loss. That's the big, big takeaway from that. Are there any questions on APAN? Or in the room? All right. So this piggybacks off that, and it shows knowledge management in action. In a world that's loaded with data, we can hit information overload. And you see that figure in the top left. He's, he's standing there in chaos. So how do leaders make good decisions amidst all this chaos? Without knowledge management, we have no direction. Um, we don't know which way to go. So we have some of our five W's and an H down, um, pointing into where we start with some of the subordinate levels. So what we want to do, knowledge management in action, enables the organization to focus and direct, and then starting and going from the bottom up and bold. The right information in the right format to the right person at the right time and in the right place to make decisions. So the people, process and processes, and tools excuse me, are represented by the gears here. Um, this gear at each level and at the subordinate levels, these, the pillars are leveraged. So the people, processes, and tools pillar of that Parthenon, um, depending on the requirement. And that will produce actionable knowledge for decision makers as we get to those higher levels. So as knowledge is created, digested, and used at those higher levels, KM will continue to provide you with a direction and ability to make better decisions. So that's an endless pattern of knowledge generation. And when you have effective knowledge management, it will provide clarity and minimize risk, which we have in the bottom left, excuse me, bottom right, <laughs> and it'll maximize organizational performance. Okay, so knowledge management, as we mentioned earlier, it's a crucial aspect to mission command, as it was uh, demonstrated here by the numerous references to knowledge management and doctrine. So some key takeaways here, Army Doctrine Reference Publication, ADRP 1-03, KM is part of the Army Universal Task List. KM is also an identified metal task, Mission Essential Task List. It is Universal Task Number 5.3.1, and it's also Specified Task Number 2 of Mission Command. And the ADRP 6-0 Mission Command Knowledge Management is the entire Chapter 3. It's not just a section or a paragraph. It has its own full chapter. So again, KM is a crucial, crucial aspect to Mission Command. It also has its own ATP, 6-1.1. And then KM has its own proponent at Fort Leavenworth, as I mentioned. Colonel Kitchens is there. And that's AR 5-22, the force modernization proponent here. Are there any questions about KM and doctrine? If Major Balgos was here today, he would note that it's not something we've made up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so some positions to be aware of are, I've mentioned KMOs, KMRs, I've mentioned content management a little bit, um, but a KMO is someone who's obtained that one ECHO Army Skill Identifier. They do that by attending that three-week course, qualification course at Fort Leavenworth. The KMO is also more of a senior level position. You can see that um, in the first note under the first bullet. And you'll see the contrast in a moment to the difference between KMRs. So the KMO determines how to best influence the organizational culture to leverage the available tools and ensure that knowledge sharing, knowledge sharing efficiency, and knowledge continuity are in place and best support staff operations and mission command. KMOs also lead the organization's KIMWIG, KM Working Group, in order to best determine its strengths and weaknesses and how to bridge the gaps in knowledge processes. 
So as you can see, again, it's uh, required at those senior command levels in comparison to KMR, which is more of a requirement at the directorate level. So KMRs are uh, representatives who have attended the 20-hour KMR course taught by a One Echo certified KMO. The KMR is the primary KM professional who assists staff with implementing KM best practices from their mission command systems, collaborative tools, and organizational processes. The first place the KMR supports their staff is with their participation in the, Kim, in the KMWG, Kim Wig, with the KMO, the officer. And KMRs are required, again, at the directorate level. And the last role that we see here is the position of content manager. <coughs> it's often overlooked, but content management is a specified metal task, and content managers helps guide staff on how to best manage their content on the digital platforms that we have available, like SharePoint, like the ShareDrive and MillSuite. OneNote extends even all the way out to email, your desktop, that sort of thing. It also applies to non-digital content, such as hard copy files stored in drawers, your desk area, and so on. So when you have content that's properly managed, it's easier to find, so you don't have to spend hours looking for information. And then we have a real world statistic that we do like to make you guys aware of. The average worker wastes two and a half hours a day or about 30% of their work, work day and weeks um, searching for content and information. And that um, comes from the source of the information, the lifeblood of the enterprise. So in the Army Reserve, this translates to over $23 million per year in waste and it's over $95,000 a day. And we'll talk more about um, being fiscally responsible and how KM can help with that. <clears throat> so now that we've talked about the different um, KM professional roles that there are, um, do we have any questions before we talk about some of the characteristics? Okay. Feel free to chime in on APAN if you do have questions. We also have a Q&A feature there too. So a KM professional does not have to be the KMO or the KMR. It can be anyone who's willing to learn and make their organization better. And this will give you some ideas about who should be um, a KM professional. Or when you're selecting a KMO or KMR, you'd like to ensure that they have the right, you want to have the right person for the right job. So you just don't want to place just anyone into a KM role. And you might note, um, although it might depend on the organization, in general, a junior soldier um, might not have enough influence or credibility in an organization um, to direct or suggest changes. So that's why we do highlight that. And also, if you have someone who's not, who doesn't want to be in KM and they're appointed or they're voluntold to do it, um, they're not going to be willing to push those cultural boundaries. and really strive to identify and bridge um, the knowledge gaps that the organization has. You don't want to have someone also who um, necessarily knows a lot of K about KM already, um, but you do want to seek someone who's willing to learn, be innovative, adaptable, and ready to work independently. And we, lastly, we also need someone who's not necessarily afraid of technology they don't have to be an IT expert, but they can't be working from a basis of fear, especially since um, the third pillar is tools, and tools are always changing, and they often depend on the network that they reside on, you know, and the limitations of, of that, such as the ARNet. Is there anybody out there on APAN or in the room that any of those characteristics stick out to you, or you disagree, or you agree? Um, remember, this class is a discussion based, so we would like your input. Mm -hmm. It makes, well, sen makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> make sure that the, the bullet there, not a junior soldier of staff, and, uh, not only do, does a junior soldier not have influence, but it also cripples the senior leaders in, in accessing <laughs> the information. 
Agreed. Major Faber totally agrees with your statement. <laughs> Great. Anybody else out there? Well, willing to learn this out. Sorry, Marcel, I work in the G1. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, willing to learn, that sticks out to me because there's just people that are not willing mm -hmm. to learn. So that if they're not willing to learn, it's just it's a fail already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're not going to care. They're going to do the, the minimum. They're not going to be effective. Kind of puts everything on hold when they're not willing to, to learn mm -hmm. to change. And um, it was funny. I was also looking at the Nada Junior soldier staff member. And the major, he, he does have a point. Um, but there are a lot of junior soldiers and staff members that do have a lot of knowledge and experience mm -hmm. and can bring things to the table. So I'm not, I don't really agree with that, <laughs> with that one. That's where being a, um, an open and closed organization comes into play mm -hmm. and not being afraid to make mistakes, but also being open to new ideas no matter where they come from. You know, it might be a right, private who has thought of something innovative. Soldier or staff member may, may have a great mm -hmm. idea, but just because they're a staff member or, or a junior, you know, they're mm -hmm. not going to count or not going to be, you know, yeah. consider, you know. I think putting it in the perspective of leading KM within an organization, you need to have someone who's mature. But you also need to be willing to mentor, guide, and develop, and leverage the skill set. And I think that's what was, in, what was meant. I think you're all saying pretty much the same thing. Mm -hmm. At the highest level, when you're dealing with KM professionals, KMRs and KMOs, it does require a maturity, uh, certain characteristics that drive that can help drive the integration of knowledge management within the organization, which includes leveraging the skill sets that you have within the organization that may not have that level of experience, but are energized and have value in the knowledge management integration process. So totally agree with, with everything that's said. And you're absolutely right, sir, because <laughs> especially, like I'll take myself for an example. I'm not, I'm on active duty orders right now. On the civilian side, I do IT for the Navy. Mm. So there's a lot of people here in this building that are on orders, right. and they yeah. may be junior on the military side, but they may have that level of experience on the civilian side right. that they mm -hmm. can bring something to the table. Absolutely. And that, again, that requires that, that <laughs> understanding within the organization to identify those people that just because of rank, that we shouldn't count them out because they may have that level of experience from some other areas that were, that allow them to do the things that we need them to do. But again, yeah, it's, go ahead. Well, when I saw that bullet, this is Major Finn again, not a junior soldier, is, is what I've seen happen in organizations is that the junior soldier gets it because they get tasked to do it because it, people, people think they don't have anything else mm -hmm. better. Right. So they mm -hmm. get involved in it, they get invested in it, they, they become masters of managing uh, a SharePoint site or yeah. BCS3 is what I'm thinking of specifically. You know, to manage movement out on the battlefield, and when when a leader comes in and says, uh, uh, "I need to find this information," if that junior soldier's not in the room, they mm -hmm. can't find it because they didn't take the time to learn it. Right. And so that that's what I was referring to. Not to say that a junior soldier shouldn't be able to do it. I saw me four actually run a whole uh, CSTX one year uh, because he was the only one that was operating the radios. All right. So he was directing traffic on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And really just realized what was happening until two hours into the fight. So, yeah, this, mm -hmm. this is go ahead. I'm sure. Uh, I noticed that you know you have several boats that actually come run right into each other, which is ability mm -hmm. to influence organizational change, credibility within the organization, mm -hmm. strong communication skills. Now, mm -hmm. oftentimes, if a person that's a technical expert can master those three, or if at least the ability to influence change in communication skills. And it's a lot easier to get buying from some leaders. Exactly. Mm -hmm. you know, so that, I think that, that there's, there's the art and the science in, in that element of Perfect. getting change, managing change. You guys get it. That's except this is <laughs> meant to be a talking slide yeah. where you're thinking through it in terms that you understand within your organizations. Mm -hmm. Nothing is, is constant. I mean, it's a moving picture, and you need to be prepared to adjust based on the needs of the organization and pick the right people accordingly. And we've had some good discussion on APAN. Uh, Sergeant Bop said, at the battalion and below level, it almost seems like we need to watch for people who are KM-minded and nudge them into the role. Uh, Major Faber said the challenge could uh, 
could be where commands are relying on that one person to make this entire process work. And uh, Sergeant Bob agreed, much like so many things, if there isn't the command culture buy-in, it will only be good and growing until that one person moves. Great discussion. Okay. Thank you very much for y'all's discussion. Great okay. discussion. So knowledge management is everywhere. And here on this slide, we have a few examples of KM and also a few KM mistakes. Um, whether we're collaborating over APAN like we are now, um, also DCS, Defense Collaboration Service, which we've used in the past. Um, we've moved to Adobe Connect at this time. The phone and other meeting platforms. We also share information uh, regularly through emails, the share drive, SharePoint, and other digital platforms. But it all starts um, with people, relationships, and the organizational culture. So you see in the top right, we have a picture of people talking, you know, just at the desk side, water cooler type talk. Um, that's actually KM and KM in practice. So you also see um, on this example a few common mistakes an organization would make. We've talked about content management, and we have some examples here on a shared drive um, where we're saving outdated information, saving multiple copies of things, or multiple versions of the same file. So all of these make it harder for you and your organization to find information, and they do take up valuable storage space digitally. And then emails, we have it um, blocked out, but what that is, that's an all-hands email. And you know what we want to encourage is the use of links, um, especially um, when something's going to an all-hands distro, because if you have a lot of large attachments, that's going into every single person's inbox. Whereas links would allow all those people have one central location where they can view, update if needed. They can co-author, which is another thing we discuss um, in, in our training that we offer, and collaborate with those documents too. So we have to leverage the KM techniques and enablers. No matter what we're doing, it has a KM component to it. It all does come back to people at the end of the day. So if people aren't willing to talk, the rest of it means nothing. We want to make sure that that culture, again, is that open culture. We have relationships um, that are open and not toxic. The, the key here is to recognize that KM offers you solutions that prevent this, minimize mm -hmm. this, and, and, try, and promoting that within your organization, recognizing it, number one, then promoting it within your organization and allowing us to help you overcome some of these challenges, which then provide us with greater opportunities within the organization to save money, the same resources, the same time and dollars. So that's 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 really what's out there for for the organization to leverage is those are those CAM techniques and skills and those disciplines that get after doing things more efficiently, more effective, while at the same time protecting resources or saving dollars and time. So now we'll talk a lot more about meetings and how those affect dollars and time, too. So some key benefits of knowledge management. Number one here, we have improved meeting management. Not everything requires a meeting, especially a face-to-face -face meeting. Knowledge management can help by providing these techniques to drive higher levels of efficiency and effectiveness. It helps with meeting management, meeting ma uh, analysis, and battle rhythm development to make organizations more efficient. So through this, um, KM helps you identify whether or not the correct people are attending your meetings, whether it was the right type of meeting, and I, as well as identifying meeting scopes in accordance with your organizational priorities. Knowledge management also provides clarity on how to manage knowledge through improved content management that we've talked about, making sure your SharePoint and your Share Drive aren't a dumping ground, making sure it's not too difficult for you and others to find your products, and that they're all named in a way that you can access them, leverage them, and others can use them too to prevent that rework. You want to instill a practice um, with knowledge management by um, analyzing your internal activities and conducting a product analysis. So that comes to the why do we do what we do? Are we reusing what we can? And are we 
creating products that are necessary or <coughs> doing unnecessary rework. We want to make sure that our products serve a purpose. And then uh, also we want to make sure our organization, again, are an open culture, willing to change, exchange ideas, and learn new ways to collaborate. And we promote that with KM. We also help build innovative and learning organizations. We might be forced to collaborate, and sometimes in organizations we're either doing it inefficiently due to turnover or continuity issues or version control problems that we've talked about. People might even be frustrated and not know how to use tools, but CAM will help you identify those issues and codify a plan to address those gaps. I think one of the things that, Ms. Joe Pedoni, one of the things that stands out to me that is a key benefit of knowledge management is that it really does reinforce leverage uh, lessons learned and best practices. Everything we do in, in terms of organization, regarding organizational performance, should have some level of discipline in it that captures the goodness or the stuff that's not so good for the purposes of leveraging it to maximize organizational, to either improve performance or to leverage that lesson in maintaining performance over time. So KM reinforces that. Um, an example that came to mind, that comes to mind, is the, the recent hurricane support that we had. Um, one of the things that, one of the first things the organization did was reach out to the Center for Army Lessons Learned and pull lessons learned from other hurricane experiences and use that as part of the baseline for helping determine what was necessary or what type of things were necessary in order to plan for the support for the hurricane operations that we anticipated coming up. So don't underestimate the power of lessons learned and best practices is the message. And KM goes along, reinforces that to its practices and its, its disciplines. Great. So meeting management is part of mission command. It's part of doctrine. And you might remember the 10 KM questions from the beginning, those where we introduce the concept of meeting analysis. Um, General Lucky spoke at a town hall and he talked about a slide where it showed feedback from the organization and you saw wide, everyone felt that there were too many overlapping meetings. So we do have a lot of meetings. I think a lot of people would agree with that. <laughs> and in doctrine, we have clear guidelines to hold working groups, discussion briefs, and boards. But each demand analysis, and we do have, um, although those have a unique structure to drive overall success, we have some control over how we conduct the meetings. So doctrines reinforcing the need to have the meetings, but how we do it and the methods we use are up to us. Again, not everything requires that face-to-face -face meeting. We have to gear the meetings that we hold to the required outcomes. So that's where we have a responsibility to maximize efficiencies and protect resources and not waste time or money. So we see that here. This is the case in point. Knowledge management provides a structure to analyze those meetings and make sure what you're doing is necessary for the outcome. A lot of you have probably thought, you know, walked out of a meeting and thought, there's an hour I've, I've never, you know, of my life I won't get back, <laughs> or two hours, you know. Why was I in that meeting? I, you know, I didn't have to give any input. I didn't gain anything out of it. I see everyone in the room nodding, I'm sure, on APAN. Um, everyone can relate to that feeling. So our time is money, and we can save man hours by not um, having unnecessary meetings in the first place, and then also um, working to ensure that the meetings we do hold are more efficient and effective. So meeting management helps organizations review the meeting that they're currently having, why they're having it, what the inputs are, what the outputs are, who needs to be there? You know, does this really have to be a meeting at all? Or can it be a phone call, an email, a huddle, conversation, chat, that sort of thing? So you can see um, it's quantified here. Of course, if you have 
we've talked about if you have a general in the room, that's it's just going to compound from there. So we have an obligation and a responsibility to use these resources wisely. And one technique to do um, what we are talking about is a seven-minute drill. And this is an example of a seven-minute drill. It's a tool that we use in knowledge management to make sure a meeting is beneficial. So you can get familiar um, with the meeting by looking at the slide. And it's called seven-minute drill because when a leader has seven minutes, they really look into you know, the heart of this um, document. They should know everything about the meeting. We do recommend that it be one of the first slides in every meeting and also um, included in email invitations as well. So it's a tool that you can change and adjust it um, and use to meet your needs. It forces people to do the honest analysis and planning required to hold meetings. So do we need to have a meeting in the first place? You know, if so, it's going to tell you, the seven minute drill will tell you the type of meeting that you see, the first circled ellipse area, where whether it be a working group, an information brief, decision brief, or a board. When you know the type of meeting, it'll help you know what your inputs and outputs are. It will also um, set expectations. For example, if it's a decision brief, you'll know at the end you'll need to reach a decision. You want to know what your inputs and outputs of the meeting are. If you don't have any inputs or outputs, what's the point of the meeting? Just like what's the purpose of the meeting. You want to make sure that that's short to the point, that you have a reason for holding it. We also recommend that you link your meetings to commander's priority or doctrine. Otherwise, why are you holding you know, a, a formal meeting? It might just be a better way to exchange information with a conversation. And the seven minute drill asks you to think through who should attend the meeting. You want to make sure you have the appropriate people there, be they subject matter experts, for example, um, or if you have other sections in the organization that might be impacted or have knowledge of the subject that you're discussing. You want to make sure that everyone who's attending has a purpose for being there. So people do, in general, have angst and heartburn about meetings. But by using this tool, um, generally people realize that we don't need all those people there, or they could just have a quick huddle. So in depth, we do go into this um, at length in KMR training. We discuss the seven minute drill and how it comes into play with battle rhythm analysis as well. And it's in our KMSOP. There's, a, there's an mm -hmm. appendices within our KMSOP that lays it out in greater detail. So you don't have to go to KMR training to get mm -hmm. this stuff. So, um, but it does provide structure within the four categories that, that are there. Working groups require a, di a different type of structure, you know, require different inputs uh, based on the outputs. Your decision brief obviously needs to be geared towards whoever the, the, the decision maker is, right? Information briefings are set to provide information, but the outcome of that or the output, it should be some something of value. Um, there may be some other way. So it forces you, the point is it forces you to think about what you're doing and how you're going to get there. And at the end of when, when at, at the end, determining its value and whether or not you're on the right path. So that's, it's a great tool to follow. A little bit of time and you get some great value out of it. And there's a comment <coughs> in uh, APN. Any explanation as to why it is a seven minutes, not six or eight? <laughs> um, does it actually take seven minutes to run through this slide? Um, this comes from the proponent. It's, they did some studies that say after seven minutes of looking at this slide, that you should know everything about this meeting. So if you get it beforehand or you sit down in the meeting or leadership sits down and after seven minutes of looking at this slide and reading through it, they know everything that they need to know. So you can hit the high points and not get distracted. The key is to tying this to the appendix within the SOP and then it talks about some of the mm -hmm. things that go into not only putting this together but executing the, the, the working group of the meeting that you're going to execute. So, yeah. And they also say, uh, briefs I've seen with this, this as the first slide, people often say, here's a seven-minute drill and just drive past it after five seconds with no comment. Right. 
So it is important to actually discuss your seven minute drill so everybody is on the same page. It's not just a placeholder. And that's why it's important to, to hang it to the invite yeah. too mm -hmm. and then holding people accountable because if they are scrolling through it, I would submit to you if it's already hung, you should have already seen it. Exactly. So, and if, but if it's not out there to be seen, that, that's an indicator right there. But if it is out there, you know, you, you should look at it and review it. And if it's not, okay, then you need to spend some time up front to look at it. Bottom line, it's a valuable tool regardless of the circumstances that you're dealing with. And, uh, sorry, Bob, if, if I understand it correctly, it should take no more than seven minutes to review and understand everything on this, which is correct. Yes. For the Kimwig, uh, we send a seven-minute drill slide out in advance with the working group meeting, which is what Mr. Cardona is saying. So I think we're all on the yeah, we're all mm -hmm. on the same yeah, sheet. Bottom line is we just know it's there and, and how it should be used. And I believe this is eight minutes. Six minutes. Six minutes. Six to seven minutes. We wanted to show this. Let's show it. Yeah, yes. they are. Yes. Yes. And yes. we'll yes. reshare the link after this, just so, to make sure everybody has it. This is this is an eight, the six minute video. We won't show all of it, but I think you'll get the point. Well, pretty much up front. It just reinforces some things that we just talked about. Especially calendar invites. Yeah. Working. If it doesn't want to play. No. Okay. So, sorry for technical difficulties. I can I can open it open online. It. Just real quick. Yeah, this is it. I'll look in there. Is it still sharing appropriately? It's really, yeah, it's okay. We're Rhett and Link, and we wanted to show you how we created our amazing new website with Wix. Now, we know that having a great... this. It's Monday morning, you're at the office, you're settling in for the day of work, and this guy that you sort of recognize from down the hall walks right into your cubicle, and he steals your chair. Doesn't say a word, just rolls away with it. Doesn't give you any information about why he took your chair out of all of the chairs that are out there. Doesn't acknowledge the fact that you might need your chair to get some work done today. You wouldn't stand for it. You'd make a stink. You'd follow that guy back to his cubicle, and you'd say, why my chair? Okay, so now it's Tuesday morning and you're at the office. And a meeting invitation pops up in your calendar. <laughs> and it's from this woman who you kind of know from down the hall. And the subject line references some project you heard a little bit about. But there's no agenda. There's no information about why you were invited to the meeting. And yet you accept the meeting invitation. And you go. And when this highly unproductive session is over, you go back to your desk and you stand at your desk and you say, boy, I wish I had those two hours back. Like, I wish I had my chair back. <laughs> Every day, we allow our coworkers, or otherwise very, very nice people, to steal from us. And I'm talking about something far more valuable than office furniture. I'm talking about time, your time. In fact, I believe that we are in the middle of a global epidemic of a terrible new illness known as Moth. Mindless Accept Syndrome. <laughs> the primary symptom of Mindless Accept Syndrome is just accepting a meeting invitation the minute it pops up in your calendar. <laughs> it's an involuntary reflex. Ding, click, bang, it's in your calendar, gotta go, I'm already late for a meeting. <laughs> Meetings are important, right? And collaboration is key to the success of any enterprise. And a well-run meeting can yield really positive, actionable results. But between globalization and pervasive information technology, the way that we work has really changed dramatically over the last few years. And we're miserable. <laughs> and we're miserable not because the other guy can't run a good meeting. 
It's because of mass, our mindless accept syndrome, which is a self-inflicted wound. Actually, I have evidence to prove that mass is a global epidemic. Let me tell you why. A couple of years ago, I put a video on YouTube. And in the video, I acted out every terrible conference call you've ever been on. It goes on for about five minutes, and I, it has all the things we hate about really bad meetings. There's the, um, there's the moderator who has no idea how to run the meeting. There are the participants who have no idea why they're there. The whole thing kind of collapses into this collaborative train wreck, uh, and everybody leaves very angry. It's kind of funny. <laughs> Let's take a quick look, just... Just a little. Our goal today is to come to an agreement on a very important proposal. As a group, we need to decide if. Hi. We're just joined. Hi, Joe. Work from home today. Hi, Joe. Thanks for joining us. Stay great. Uh, just saying we have a lot of people on the call that want to get through. So let's get them all called to dive right in. Our goal today is to come to an agreement on a very important proposal. As a group, we need to decide if. Hi, this is Joy. No? I thought I heard you. Not familiar? Yeah, it sounds familiar to me too. A couple of weeks after I put that online, 500,000 people in dozens of countries, I mean dozens of countries, watched this video. And three years later, it's still getting thousands of views every month. It's close to about a million right now. In fact, some of the biggest companies in the world... This continues on. It's a good reference, but we wanted you to can, tie for in... For the sake of time, we're going to move. But again, if you, have up, if you have time to see this, it's worth watching. And if you have an opportunity to share, if you guys are going to talk about meeting management and those kinds of things within your organization, it may be something that you'd, you'd like to leverage and use. It does open up some real ideas about, you know, what we do, why we do it, and how we should do things differently. Okay. Go ahead, Jen. Okay. And then in knowledge <coughs> management, we do talk quite a bit about the third and final pillar of tools. The right tool should be used for the right job. But in the end, everything does start with people, relationships, and organizational culture. So this is not an all-encompassing <coughs> list. There are more, more tools out there. And there are new tools developed every day. Tools are first and foremost predicated on the culture of the organization and the people. If the people are unwilling to talk to each other, tools don't mean anything. So here we're talking about um, a few of the collaborative platforms going across the top. We have DCS, GBS, and APAN, which we're using today for Adobe Connect. We also have Gears, SMS, SharePoint, Mill Suite, we have Link, which we use for IM, TMT, and the Office Suite. So these different tools we all have available, um, extensive training by the KM team, either by a SharePoint, SharePoint Spug, Brown Bag, or you know, more in-depth classes like our SharePoint training. Also at the bottom, we have a red box around the 70-20-10, and that is a concept from Princeton University, where you learn 70% of your knowledge from real life experiences and informal interactions. So experiential learning is the most important aspect of any learning and development plan. Less than 20% of your knowledge comes from feedback and mentorship, um, where you're observing and working with role models, um, receiving mentorship. And less than 10% of your knowledge comes from formal training, schools that you go to, for example. So one good example of this concept is changing a tire. A lot of people who know how to change tires did so um, by experiencing it out in the real world, not going to a formal school for that. Again, um, that concept, you do have to be in an innovative environment um, for that to apply in general. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to read you the definitions of all these, but we do have plenty of training on it, and I'm happy to take questions after if you have questions on the particular tools. And then AdPi, um, here we have the Army KM process, 
It's a flexible five-step process that helps organizations leverage knowledge more effectively. The steps are assess, design, develop, pilot, and implement. So ADPI is a standardized approach to analyze performance. It should always be started by a leader action or leadership direction. KM leverages this uh, standardized approach to identify gaps and weaknesses and design solutions that will improve organizational performance. I'm sure some of you have seen this. From, you've probably all seen this before. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a very important skill that we use and leverage in order to, to identify gaps and weaknesses and identify solutions for KM solutions to be, to be considered. And the ADPI is a little similar if you've seen it in any other capacity. It's kind of similar to the ADI process and some others um, as well, some processes in project management too. I think in the interest of time, I will skip the definition of all the steps. Which one? Yeah. You know, assess, design, because um, I could get more in, in depth with that. But um, Yeah, so that's the aim of that. And I'm happy to explain more about ADPI after if anyone has any questions. And then every organization, as we talked about the different roles of the CAM professional, um, has those KM professionals like KMOs and KMRs. And we recommend that you do get to know them if that's not currently your role and engage with them and share the, any challenges that you're facing with them because that will help your KMO and KMR identify gaps and weaknesses and help move your organization forward through this maturity model. So the maturity model helps your organization evaluate where it is currently. And maturity does change over time. The ultimate goal is to be a knowledge-centric organization. That's a level five, um, which is one that's constantly learning and innovating. Most organizations out there are not quite there yet. Um, we start at level one, which is chaos where things are just done ad hoc, spur of the moment, knowledge isn't captured at all, it's not shared to make the organization more efficient. And then we move up from there. So level two, things start to become repeatable. Um, this is the level where most organizations are today, where leadership does recognize that there's some benefits um, that KM offers, but they have yet to fully implement KM strategies throughout their organizations. So that may lead to a perception where there's not a leadership commitment to KM. And in level two, there might be some KM tools in place, such as email, for example, but they might not be used to the, the fullest of their capability. Level three is really the first step for most organizations, where leadership integrates KM into the organizational vision and strategy. However, leadership accountability um, has to be assigned in order to ensure the CAM strategy is being achieved. And also learning that the, at this level three, it starts to become a cultural norm throughout the organization. And tools are used with you know, in free, um, increasing frequency and support knowledge sharing, capture, and reuse at that level. And then we move up from there. A level four um, is where KM starts to have a significant impact. Um, organizational leadership has defined a KM strategy and KM leadership accountability as well. And there are formal organizations supporting KM throughout the organization. KM processes become integrated into core activities and tools are used that further the knowledge sharing, knowledge sharing continuity and knowledge sharing efficiency. Level five is that ultimate goal that we talked about, where we're constantly involved in learning and innovating. So in summary, we've told a little bit of a story today, um, giving you a snapshot of the art and science of knowledge management. We have a responsibility as members of the organization to make the best decisions possible. Knowledge management is a critical part of organizational performance, and the Army recognizes that through its doctrine and teachings. And we hope that you have an appreciation for the capabilities that KM provides and how KM can help you and your organization be better at what you do. Are there any questions today or comments? 
either in the room or on AFAN. Okay. You do have another slide. We have one more slide. I have another few seconds so I can get right on. So um, our KM team offers training regularly. We're here to help and we'll do what we can to help you perform at the highest level. And we do want to thank you for joining us today and you are welcome to register for any additional training that interests you. We have cyclical training like our KM overview, which is what you're attending today, as well as collaborative tools and mill suite. And then every month we have a brown bag and a spug, which is a SharePoint user group. And then we have our SharePoint essentials, contributor, power user, site owner, and site collection administrator that we offer. So it's five levels of training in SharePoint. So thank you for joining us today for the KM overview. We look forward to seeing you at those classes. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Looks good. Looks good. Great. I would recommend.